Hey everyone, welcome to the first Ancient America's 100k q and I've been meaning to do this since we hit 100,000 subscribers and kept kicking this down the road, but I finally arrived at a good point to get this done. Before we start, I want to give a big thank you to all my subscribers. I'm completely amazed that the channel has grown this big. To say it has surpassed my expectations would be the understatement of the century. For those who have offered good feedback and words of encouragement, supported me financially, and spent time from their finite lives regularly watching and enjoying my content, but never left a like or comment, and thus have made up the great silent majority, thank you. Your support has meant a lot to me. So how this is going to work is that I'll be answering questions submitted by my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to be able to submit questions of the future, vote on future episodes, or just support the show, you can do so there. Link in the description. Obviously, this is going to be a lot different from my usual episodes, less scripted and a bit more visually sparse, or if you prefer the more exciting terms, raw and uncut. Now, I'm not an expert on all of these questions, but I'll do my best to say what I know. So without further ado, let's get started with question one. What is the consensus about when people first arrived in the Americas, and what is your opinion on the issue? Okay, so this is a bit of a loaded question, because when we ask about consensus, we have to be aware that there is still a lot of disagreement out there, especially with this topic. There's a lot of evidence and many ways to interpret it. That said, I would say the general consensus is that humans were in the Americas just over 20,000 years ago, and that is thanks in large part to the recent discovery of the White Sands footprints. Now, my opinion currently falls in line with this consensus, broadly speaking. I'm sure people are going to ask me to justify it in the comments, so I'd better go into some more detail. Now, I know that there are quote-unquote earlier sites out there, such as Chiquahita Cave in Mexico, Arroyo de Vizcaino in Uruguay, and the Cerruti Mastodon site in California, and several others. If you want to just take the earliest site and make that the arrival date, then more power to you. But I think that we need a qualitative approach in evaluating those sites. In many cases of very early sites, the evidence can be characterized as more indirect or circumstantial evidence, and critics will usually claim that those sites have been misinterpreted. Now, I don't want to break down every controversial site out there, otherwise we'd be stuck on question one for a long time. So I'm going to discuss one that I know fairly well, and one that I've seen pop up a lot in channel comments, and that's the Saruti Mastodon site. Now, if you don't know anything about the site and want some context, Mini Minuteman has a wonderful episode about the site and its history, and he presents the evidence really well. I'll link it in the description. To make a long story short, the main evidence that comes from the site are broken mastodon bones and nearby cobbles that may have been used to break the bones open and get at the marrow inside. Now, those aren't especially remarkable until you consider that the mastodon remains at Saruti date back to more than 120,000 years ago. And there are some people who champion this site, and to be fair, it's not impossible that this is a man-made site. Although it predates Homo sapiens exit from Africa, so it would most likely be a different homonym. I, and many archaeologists, would argue that these remains could be explained by other non-human factors, because animals, especially primates, can use stones to process food too. On top of that, there's no solid evidence of human or hominid activity in the Americas even close to that time, and that keeps me a bit skeptical. In other sites that have human tools, they are found in environments that might have shifted. Now, let's contrast that with what I would call a strong early site and one that I mentioned earlier, the White Sands site. Again, if you want some good context on this, archaeologist Nathaniel Fossane has a really good video on the site and the evidence, but for those who don't got time for that, This is an archaeological site that contains fossilized human footprints that were able to be dated by preserved seeds within the prints. This is a lot different from the Saruti site and most other very early sites, because human footprints can only be made by people, so it's very difficult to argue that these were created or skewed by natural processes. However, and I'm about to ruin the fun here, I've actually seen some recent pushback on White Sands because, as it turns out, The seeds that they carbon dated in the footprints may have been younger than previously thought due to the carbon reservoir. A carbon reservoir is a phenomenon that occurs when organisms in water absorb carbon that is much older than the organism itself, and so the dated remains appear older than they actually are. Since these seeds are from aquatic plants, they may be younger than the carbon dating suggests, although there's been nothing definitive as of yet. More testing needs to be done on the samples. But until then, or the next great discovery, I'm sticking with my 21,000 years date. 
I've heard there's some evidence the Polynesian explorers may have reached parts of South America and that some genetic evidence has seemed to support that. Is there anything to that? Yes, there's actually some good evidence for this, but it's often misunderstood. So this comes from a genetic study that was done on the Polynesian inhabitants of Rapa Nui, or Easter Island as it's commonly called, and the people there were found to have traces of Native American DNA that went back 19 to 23 generations ago, so about 1300 CE to 1500 CE. The data shows that these genes most closely match those of the Xenu in modern-day Colombia. Where I see a lot of misunderstanding is when I see people citing genetic evidence like this and claiming that Polynesians were the original colonizers of North America, when the evidence clearly shows that contact occurred long after the Americas had been colonized. I think it's a case of people finding the article and only reading the headline. But there's actually more evidence of pre-Columbian contact between South America and Polynesia. The most commonly cited is the sweet potato, a domesticated tuber from South America that was cultivated in Polynesia also. Somehow, it made its way from South America to the Pacific, and the most likely explanation is that it was done through humans, although this evidence is admittedly circumstantial. It's equally possible that some sweet potatoes might have washed up in Polynesia on a raft. Another similar piece of evidence is the bottle gourd, which also appears in Polynesia before contact. Another thing you'll commonly see cited are chicken remains that date to the 15th century, decades before chickens were introduced into South America by Europeans. There's been some debate about the chickens because modern chickens in South America are all genetically descended from European chickens, although it's entirely possible that those first chickens were eradicated or never mingled with later chickens. All this is to say that there is some very good evidence that Polynesians and indigenous Americans had contact at some point although the nature of that contact is a bit hazy. Why do you think so much literature focuses on Mesoamerica? All right, I'm actually kind of happy this question got asked because I've been wanting to go on an old man rant about this, and I think this actually plays into a much larger human bias that I know I'm guilty of committing. The short answer is that there's more literature on those areas because there's more interest. The real question is, why is there more interest? And I think this boils down to the fact that most people have an innate bias for what a quote-unquote ancient civilization looks like. Civilizations have agriculture, urban centers, monumental art and architecture, great leaders, and so on and so forth. When the average Joe hears the term ancient civilizations or ancient history, they immediately think of ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, Rome, India, China, etc., they may not think of people from the Central Asian steppes, the Celtic peoples of Europe, or people of the Eastern Woodlands, despite the fact that they also had very impressive cultures of their own. A big reason for why such cultures don't get no respect is what I like to call the stone bias. From what I've noticed and from my own personal experience, people usually associate a culture's success with its subsequent preservation. If a city from 2,000 years ago is still visible because its stone foundations and monuments survive, we instinctively assume that the people that built that city were a great people of a great culture because they built things that have lasted to today. In the case of the Maya, the Aztecs, the Inca, you know, the big three as I call them, a lot of their construction, monuments, and art still exist today, and they capture our imaginations. We see these and we want to know more. We automatically ascribe a certain measure of greatness to them. Now contrast that with cultures in eastern North America and the Amazon. Those cultures seldom built with stone, because they had plenty of other materials available to them, like wood and earth. As a result, their architecture and art aren't as visible as today, and they are not perceived as a quote-unquote great civilization, when we know that many of these cultures were highly sophisticated and organized and could create huge monuments and huge structures out of perishable materials. The permanence of stone is great PR. Now, I don't want this to come off as some cynical, holier-than-thou rant, because cultures like the Maya, Inca, and Aztec do deserve study, and Lord knows I love eating that up. But so do the Hopewell, the Mississippians, and the Amazonians. I want to read about them, too. That said, I do think that those big three cultures are also aided by the fact that they were conquered in what you might call an epic fashion, and those chapters of history highlight them and spark interest in them. Other parts of the Americas aren't quite like this, and I think it affects the public's interest in them. Okay, end rant. Thank you all for coming to my TED Talk.
I'd love to know more about pre-Columbian agricultural techniques. The more famous ones, aside from the three sisters, are the Aztec chinapas that combine so many plants and make for such fertile and productive soils. It would be interesting to see how much can be known about acai palms in Brazil or traditional potato farming in Peru, etc. Oh boy, so this is a big question and one that we could spend 30 minutes and a lot of research on. The person who asked this is clearly familiar with the three sisters and chinampas, and I'm assuming that most viewers are as well. I also have episodes where I go into detail on potatoes and acai palms, so I won't rehash those here, but there are other techniques worth mentioning. The most common, especially in forested areas, is Swidden agriculture, although most people probably know it as slash and burn agriculture. Slash and burn agriculture gets a pretty bad rap these days because of the slash and burn agriculture that goes on in the Amazon, but when indigenous people practiced it, it was much more sustainable because after farming a certain spot for a number of years, they would leave and allow the forest to regrow. Now, if you want to see Swidden agriculture at its best, you need to check out the Amazon. There, people would use charcoal from burns along with manure, compost, and pottery shirts to create a very fertile black soil called terra preta. Unlike the typical soil of the Amazon, it's excellent for agriculture. Even today, this black earth is sought out by locals to use in gardens. In the Amazon and much of South America, raised fields are often used as artificial fields. If you know what chinampas are, they're very similar. Now, I've talked a bit about these in the Tiwanaku episode, but I'll go ahead and repeat the basics here. If you live in or near wetlands or somewhere that is seasonally inundated, you can create a raised field that you can plant crops on. Essentially, you're irrigating in reverse. Instead of digging an irrigation system, you're raising up areas of land in a wet environment that'll stay above the water but remain irrigated. The big benefit to raised fields is that you can take the soil from the wetland and replace the soil on top of the field, and that soil tends to be enriched from the aquatic plants and animals that live there, so it's a very sustainable model of agriculture. In the Lake Titicaca Basin, raised fields also acted as heat shields and protected crops from frost, so there's a lot of really interesting applications in the highlands. Another bit of farm tech that is very popular in Mesoamerica and South America are terraces. The Inca are probably the most famous for their terraces, but other Andean and Mesoamerican cultures also built them. I'm not personally familiar with any north of Mesoamerica, but there might be some that I'm not aware of. Terraces are really useful because they turn poor hill sites into productive agricultural areas by creating level steps on which you can plant and irrigate crops. Some Inca terraces still survive today, and in some cases are even still used by the locals. The Maya also built terraces, and although you really can't see them today, they do show up on LiDAR. Lastly, early North American agriculture is something that is often forgot about. When people think of domesticated crops in the Americas, they typically think of maize, manioc, potatoes, peppers, beans, squash. Less well known is that people in the eastern woodlands, particularly in the southeast United States, cultivated and domesticated several plants, including goosefoot, sumpweed, little barley, maygrass, knotweed, and sunflowers. Although there's recently been some evidence uncovered that may point to the sunflower being domesticated in Mexico, which makes things a lot more interesting. Unfortunately, when maize gets introduced into eastern North America, it begins to dominate the agriculture there. So by the time of contact, cultivation of those early crops begins to wane a bit. With the exception of sunflower, very few of those crops were still being cultivated at contact. And even today, many of them are considered weeds by farmers. Did any diseases leap to humans from American domesticates, such as llamas, turkeys, or guinea pigs? Why might these have been less impactful than Eurasian and African domesticates diseases? This is a rough question because, honestly, we have a poor understanding of pre-contact diseases and epidemiology in pre-Columbian America. There may very well have been indigenous diseases that we just don't know about. You typically hear that Europeans never got sick from American diseases or that there were no diseases in the Americas, but that's a bit of a myth. There's evidence that tuberculosis actually existed among humans before humans ever migrated to the Americas. So conceivably, tuberculosis may have been in the Americas before contact. Also, Chagas disease, syphilis, and Rocky Mountain spotted fever were also in the Americas before contact. 
Usually when you read about the Colombian exchange, disease is often presented as a one-sided affair with swaths of natives dying off while the Europeans just stood by and watched. In reality, a lot of Europeans got sick, and they noted that in many of their accounts. In particular, if you read the Spanish accounts of the Caribbean or the Narvaez expedition in Florida, they report a lot of sickness among the Spaniards. In some cases, these were the same diseases that the natives were dying of, because with such a huge population of infectable people, these pathogens likely mutated and became more deadly to the colonizers. Despite that, Europeans still weathered those illnesses better than their native counterparts. The typical reason given for this is that Europe had more domesticated animals and cities. This has been popularized most notably by Jared Diamond's book, Gun, Germs, and Steel, School Textbooks, and also that one CGP Grey video. By the way, I love CGP Grey, so nobody come after me. Basically, they all say that because there were more domesticated animals in the old world, more diseases could jump from animals to humans, and there is indeed some truth to that. However, genetic studies of a lot of these diseases show that many of them, like tuberculosis, smallpox, malaria, and pertussis, predate the advent of agriculture and domestication. There are some instances, like measles, where scientists are fairly certain that it came from a domesticated animal. This is because a lot of these other diseases came from wild animals, and when you think about all that genetic diversity in Mother Nature, that's not that surprising. Given that fact, there should have been plenty of avenues for diseases to arise in the Americas, but for some reason, not as many lethal diseases developed, and why that is, scientists honestly aren't sure. I imagine future research is going to tell us a lot more, but for now, we can't really answer this question with total certainty. Were there other governmental structures in the Americas before contact, besides autocracy, theocracy, and the seemingly unique Tlaxcala Republic? Okay, so again, this is not an easy question to answer. The reason why things like chiefdoms and theocracies come up a lot is that they represent best guesses and approximations. The truth was probably much more complicated. To use some examples from recent episodes, the Nazca and the Moche may have had very complex political structures, but because we only know about them through archaeology, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to deduce what that would have been. So whenever you hear those terms, take them with a grain of salt. I'm glad this question brings up the Republic of Tlaxcala because this is a very unusual form of government and it's not well known about. If you want to know more about that, Stefan Milo has a good episode on it that I'll link below. Indigenous governments were almost certainly much more nuanced than we know. Even chiefdoms have a lot of complexity to them. And for those who watched the most recent episode about the Pacific Northwest, you'll know what I'm talking about. In those cases, though, we have good ethnographic accounts and surviving nations that have preserved some of those traditions. In rare cases, like the Maya, we have a lot of art and ancient written records from the Maya themselves, so we have a very good idea of how they governed themselves. We know that the Maya had kings, ruling families, and at other times, councils. That said, there's some interesting diversity in the Americas. I read The Dawn of Everything last year, and the authors go into a lot on this, you might see political structures that are seasonal. So for example, you might have several tribes come together in the winter, and during that time, the host tribe may have a position of authority during that time of gathering before the population disperses in the spring. One type of government that doesn't get a lot of attention is confederations, the best examples of which are the Iroquois, or to use their proper name, the Haudenosaunee, and the Muisca. In these systems, individual tribes or nations usually govern their own day-to-day -day affairs, but things like foreign policy are usually decided by the larger group, and that governing body can work in a lot of ways. If you want to watch a very good video on how the Haudenosaunee Confederation worked, Historia Civilis has an excellent video on the topic that I highly recommend watching. I'll link it below. How did property rights work in pre-Columbian cultures, or land ownership, or communal versus personal agricultural space, or the right to build homes on said land. Okay, first governments, now property. Okay, so I'm going to answer this in some pretty broad strokes, but I want you to keep in mind that there's a lot of variation in how property was managed and owned by individuals and communities. After all, we're talking about two entire continents here. There's a persistent notion among people that Native Americans had no concept of private property, and this is usually born out of quotes from people like Sitting Bull, who lamented the closure and fencing off of land that was open to everyone for hunting. In nomadic and mobile societies that rely on hunting and gathering for sustenance, 
private property was never private as we would understand it. But many of these people did have notions of communal or common property that could be used by everyone for hunting, fishing, and foraging. That doesn't mean that there were never strict borders between or within certain groups. In some cases, communities could take a heavier hand in actively managing those communal resources. There are accounts of Mi'kmaq chiefs delegating certain areas of forests and rivers to specific families for their use, although in that case, it doesn't seem to have been very rigid, from what I understand. Now, as I discussed in my most recent video, the tribes of the Pacific Northwest Coast took this even further and had full-blown property rights associated with specific areas that belonged to specific families. Now, what really fuels private property is agriculture. Once you have agriculture, you usually have some form of ownership. Now, that ownership could reside with the farmer and his family, a noble whose land is being worked by tenants, or could be owned by a temple or the rulers themselves. In Mesoamerica and the Andes, you see a variety of such types of ownership. In the case of the Inca, the Sapa Inca was the theoretical owner of all the land in the empire. Now, I know from my own research that rulers in Mesoamerica could have private lands used for farming or tracts of forests that they might use for hunting. In the Northeast, among the Haudenosaunee, the land was actually owned and cultivated by women and matriarchs of various families. Ultimately, this isn't an easy question to answer just because there's such a huge amount of diversity between different cultures and societies. Different people had their own conceptions of property depending on their lifestyle and circumstances. And truthfully, I'm not well-read enough to go into huge detail on that. What trade items in the Americas were found furthest from its source? For example, if chocolate were discovered at Chaco Canyon. Also, what trade items had the largest areas of trade? And where was the source of these items? Okay, this is a good question. Um, I've never seen this quantified, but a few things do come to mind. First, like the question says, chocolate from Mesoamerica was traded with the Southwest. And we have indisputable evidence of that because they have found pots in the American Southwest that have traces of theobromine, one of the key chemicals in chocolate. Another trade item you see traded in the Southwest are macaw feathers. That one is interesting because not only were people trading macaws, but in the southwest at the site of Casas Grandes, or Paquime if you are of a Mesoamerican bent, there's evidence that macaws were actually being bred there. Another good that travels a long way is obsidian, particularly in North America. The best source of obsidian in North America comes from the Yellowstone area, and obsidian from there has been found in multiple places in eastern North America, so it was getting moved around huge distances, thousands of kilometers. Copper from the Great Lakes also got traded all over the eastern U.S., and you can even find it at sites near the Gulf Coast. In South America, spondylus shells travel south from the coast of Ecuador to Peru, sometimes pretty far inland, so we know that it was getting traded very far afield. Those are what come to my mind, but if anyone has anything else to add, please put it in the comments. How did pre-Columbian people view warfare? Warfare is such a complex and fraught topic in the Old World. Going back to our oldest records of it, I assume it must have been equally complex in the Americas. This is a topic I've been dreading because I've actually read surprisingly little about the art of war in the pre-Columbian Americas, and there's a lot of variation between places and cultures. I've actually got a good book on the topic on my book list, but I haven't bought it yet, so this is going to be more of a crapshoot answer. War wasn't everywhere all the time, but it definitely flared up at certain times and places in different forms. When we think of warfare, we usually think of armies engaging in pitched battles, and in more populated areas of Mesoamerica and the Andes, that was definitely the case from what we know from historical accounts. The Inca conquered whole empires during their own conquests and relied on the sheer size of their armies to intimidate people into submission. There are also examples of fortifications that you can find in both areas, like walls, moats, trenches, or just strategically located settlements. From art that has survived in many of those areas, we can see that leaders boasted of their military accomplishments. Warfare in Mesoamerica, and to some extent in the Andes, also prized captives so that they could be sacrificed or executed after the battle. If you ever look at the Bon and Pac murals, they show a Maya battle scene, and in those scenes, no one's getting killed. Instead, the enemy are being captured so that they can be killed later in a ceremony. I'd say that in both of these regions, our picture is fairly clear because the Spanish had to conquer them by force, and they left us a lot of records about how their opponents resisted. 
In North America, warfare was clearly occurring because we know that by the Mississippian period, cities and towns were being fortified. We also have evidence of large-scale violence, the most infamous of which is probably the Crow Creek site. For those who don't know, this is an archaeological site in South Dakota on the Crow Creek Indian Reservation that was the site of a massacre before European contact. At this site, they found hundreds of mutilated remains. As macabre as that is, it does show that violence and warfare could happen on a large scale in North America. I've also seen a few authors say that war might have looked more like what we would call raiding. In the historical period, you see a lot of accounts where colonists report guerrilla tactics and -and hit-and-run raids. Among the nations of the Pacific Northwest, warfare was really endemic up there as well and could be fought for a variety of reasons. If you want some more information on that, you can go back and check out that episode. I do discuss it in a little bit more detail. So I know that that's not the most in-depth answer, but honestly, this isn't my forte. And, you know, I hope it gives you some food for thought. Can you go over how many writing systems existed in the Americas? Because so many scholars judge a society by its writing capabilities. So first of all, to address the underlying sentiment in that question... Most cultures through most of history have passed information orally, and this can actually be done with a high degree of precision with the right methods and practice. Just because a culture doesn't have writing doesn't mean that they don't have literature, history, prose, or philosophy. They certainly had those, just not a way to write them down for us to read. Now, I'll go through those writing systems in a second, but I do just want to point out that it's possible that further writing systems existed but have not survived. If a culture only wrote on perishable materials and failed to preserve said materials, the script would be lost. So, it's impossible to say with certainty how many scripts there were before contact. The scripts that we're familiar with are Maya script, Nahuatl script, Teotihuacano script, Isthmian script, Olmec script, and Zapotec script. If you want to expand that definition to include proto-writing or pictographs, You can lump in winter counts from the Plains Nations, Mishtec writing, and there are some archaeologists who believe that Mississippians had pictographic writing based on some rock carvings and art. If you want to ignite a fiery debate, you could argue that quipus are a form of writing, but in my opinion, that cannot currently be proven. Now, post-contact, you also get writing scripts like the Cherokee, Ojibwe, and Inuit syllabaries, Obviously, those systems can still be read, and many of them are still used to this day. However, of the ancient systems that we are aware of, only two have been deciphered, and those are Maya and Nahuatl scripts. So those tend to get the most attention. I know that there's been a lot of work trying to decipher Zapotec script, uh, most notably from Javier Urcid, but those efforts have not yet been successful. If there's a script I've forgotten, let me know in the comments. How widely was the written language of the Maya or related systems used? Is there a particular reason or theory for why writing didn't become as ubiquitous as it did in much of Eurasia? I think this question boils down to literacy and function. First, we have to understand who was using writing in the Maya world. As far as we can tell, writing was done by scribes and occasionally nobles. There's a debate about how literate the Maya populace was, and this is my opinion based on the reading I've done, but I highly doubt that the average Maya person could read with any proficiency, beyond perhaps the calendar. That means that literacy would have been restricted to a very select group of people. When you see writing spread in other cultures, it's usually because it's being used by a wider demographic, like bureaucrats or merchants, for example. When writing is restricted, it doesn't spread as easily. Now, in fairness, many people adjacent to the Maya, like the Zapotecs and the people of central Mexico, also used writing to various degrees. But if its use was just as restricted, it probably would not have spread. A final thing I'll mention is that these writing systems are not easy to learn. They're pretty complicated logographic syllabaries. Alphabetic and featural scripts, by comparison, usually spread in a population faster because they're much easier for the everyman to learn. You need much less of an education to learn those types of scripts. Do the demographic history or genetics match the linguistic diversity in the Pacific Northwest? Oh boy, just as I thought I was done with the Pacific Northwest. So to answer this, I actually had to dig a bit online, but I found a genetic study from 2016 that addresses this question. And that study shows that there is a genetic relationship to linguistic patterns that we see. 
Now, these are still closely related, but geneticists can see differences and relationships. What I found even more interesting is that for certain language families like the Salish, there are related languages much further inland that also have genetic relationships, and these can help cue us into how these language groups developed and spread. Now, if this interests you and you want to read that original study, I'll link it in the description below. What got you interested in the history of the Americas? Most of my life, I've always been a bit of an ancient history nerd, but I'd never really dived into the Americas. Five years ago, I could not have told you much beyond the standard historical talking points about the big three, the Aztec, Inca, and Maya. What really changed that was when I bought Dr. Ed Barnhart's lecture series on Mesoamerica, and it blew my mind on how rich that history was. There were so many cultures I never knew existed, and the ones that I was familiar with had so much more depth to them than I knew. I actually ended up re-listening to that entire series because I enjoyed it so much. Shortly after, I got 1491 by Charles Mann from the library and proceeded to have my mind blown all over again. And I loved that book so much that I bought it, and it's always the book I recommend for people who want a primer on ancient American history. What made this all exciting for me was that this was stuff that I had never learned in school, and I kind of felt like my education had robbed me. I felt like a kid who's been denied dairy his whole life and then discovers the ice cream store. Uh, what's more, this is ancient history that was in my backyard, and yet it didn't get a lot of appreciation, and I've been hooked ever since. What inspired you to create this channel? Several years ago, I was going to create a history podcast. This was shortly after I'd gotten interested in ancient American history, but the focus of this podcast was going to be biographies of people in history that I felt were overlooked. However, I decided to switch to ancient American history because it was a history that I felt was not being taken as seriously as ancient history around the world, despite the fact that it's just as compelling. As I started researching and writing up episodes, I started making lists of visual references that I would need to set up, because if I talked about location A, I wanted the listener to be able to look it up on a map. Or if I referenced a style of art, I wanted the listener to know what I was talking about. After doing that for a while, I quickly realized that if I wanted to do justice to these topics, I needed to make the podcast a video channel so that people could actually see what I was talking about. And so I took a month or two to learn Adobe Illustrator and After Effects, and after some guidance and encouragement from the right people, the channel was born. What do you do for a living? All I'll say is that I work in software. YouTube is my hobby and will likely remain so unless the Patreon support goes completely nuclear and explodes. If you could go back in time and visit a place in history for one day, where and when would you choose? Oh, uh, this is a tough choice. Honestly, barring a time of war, disease, or famine, and assuming the language barrier wouldn't be a problem, there are very few places I wouldn't want to see. If someone showed up in a shady-looking van on my street and it said free time machine on the side, I'd probably hop right in. One place that would be really cool to see would be Cahokia, because I've been to the site and I've spent a lot of time imagining what it must have been like, so it'd be neat to go there and actually see it. Another cool site would be Tiwanaku in its heyday, just to see how all those stone portals and gates and buildings fit together. Honestly, as long as you aren't visiting some catastrophic moment, I don't really think there's a wrong answer to this. During your research for this channel, was there any big fact or lore that surprised or amazed you? Yes, many, in fact. Um, there's usually one or two things that'll jump out at me in the making of each episode. The episode that probably had the most surprises for me was the Dorset episode. I knew so little going in that everything I learned was so fascinating. Learning about driftwood, the connections between Siberia and Arctic cultures, the spread of the bow and arrow, and the decline of the Dorset were all really big, mind-blowing moments. The copper culture episode was also a real rabbit hole to go down. While I knew that copper existed in the Americas, I didn't realize that copper working was as prolific as it was. Um, another thing I've learned more about than I ever thought I would is about ancient drugs, hallucinogens, and entheogens. But that's the beauty of this channel, is that I'm always learning new things. It's really fun. It's really rewarding. Okay, that wraps us up for today. I hope this was enjoyable, and if it wasn't, I hope that it was at least tolerable. Special thanks to my patrons listed here. You guys are the best. If you would like to join the ranks of these fine individuals and support the show, you can do so on Patreon.
The link will be in the description below. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us on Facebook. Take care and we'll see you in our next episode.